And we begin in East Africa, where Ethiopians bid former longtime leader Meles Zenawi a final farewell on Sunday before he was laid to rest in Addis Ababa. A host of African heads of state, along with a U.S. delegation, joined thousands of mourners at a state funeral. Mr. Meles's flag-draped coffin was carried through the streets of the capital on a horse-drawn carriage from the National Palace to Meskel Square. He was then buried at the Holy Trinity Cathedral, where some of the country's most illustrious people are interred, including former Emperor Haile Selassie. Mr. Meles's, Mr. Meles died at age 57 in a Belgium hospital last month following a lengthy undisclosed illness. He ruled Ethiopia for more than 20 years. Now, the late Prime Minister Mellis earned praise abroad for improvements in the economy, education and health care. But human rights groups sharply criticized him for various abuses, including restrictions on independent media. And among the dignitaries and African leaders praising Mr. Mellis's record were Susan Rice, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, South African President Jacob Zuma and Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan. My delegation and I are here to be with the great and brotherly people of Ethiopia as he mourn the passage of one of the most distinguished leaders of his generation, whose immense contributions to national development, regional and continental stability will be celebrated forever. History will record that Prime Minister Zanawe uses immense gift of intellect, eloquence, and vision to share the parts of remarkable growth and transmission for Ethiopia. This is a painful period for the people of Ethiopia to lose such a young leader, a patriot, and a visionary. He taught himself and many others so much. But he wasn't just brilliant. He wasn't just a relentless negotiator and a formidable debater. He wasn't just a thirsty consumer of knowledge. He was uncommonly wise, able to see the big picture and the long game. Now, Ethiopia is the third country this year alone to experience the death of an incumbent. In July, Ghana suffered the untimely passing of President John Atta Mills. And in April, Malawi President Bingu Amtarika died of a heart attack. In all, three case, in all three cases, a successor, as stipulated by the country's constitution, was formally sworn in literally within days. In Ethiopia, Deputy Prime Minister Haile Mariam Dessalain has assumed the duties of Prime Minister, but he has not yet been formally sworn in. Now, to discuss the significance of these events in light of Africa's quest for democracy, we are joined by Kweku Nwama, Assistant Professor at American University's School of International Service. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me again. Professor Nwama, so what are your thoughts on uh, Ethiopia and the passing of uh, Minis Prime Minister Melis? <clears throat> well, I think um, Ethiopia has managed to avoid the fate of, let's say, Guinea, uh, where the passing of uh, a leader plunges the entire country into conflict, into conflict. Uh, for now. <clears throat> and I, I think that that's commendable. Now, what were your thoughts, though, when uh, you, you heard not only what happened in Ethiopia, but also in Ghana? His, these are countries, as you just mentioned, in, Equatorial, in uh, Guinea Conakry, which have a history of coups. Did it enter your mind at all that, oh, my goodness, this poses a potential problem? Of course, in Africa, you always have to uh, think about coups, especially now that we've seen the reemergence of coups. But in the Ethiopian case, I, I didn't think that there was going to be a coup because uh, the, uh, the TPLF actually dominates the military mm -hmm. and because they still run the state, uh, it was going to be an internal secession issue. Now, what about in the case of, uh, say, Malawi, which even though it ended up well, there was that issue or potential possibility that maybe uh, President Joyce Banda would not be sworn in? I think Malawi actually deserves a lot of credit because there we've seen the transitional norms and rules tested and is pre prevailed uh, for democracy. In other places such as Ghana, we haven't seen um, the entire institution 
face a strong test yet because we've had an internal session and we don't know what's going to happen. But Malawi, where you had all these problems before, and yet they managed to uh, go through it. So I think that's a, that's a good sign. So what is it that made this happen? Is it the Constitution? I mean, when you have uh, literally within hours of the announcement of the death of uh, President Atta Mills, uh, President John Mahama is sworn in, and literally within a few days, you have Joyce Banda sworn in as the President of Malawi. So is it attributable to the soundness of the Constitution that paved the way for this smoothness? Yes and no. In certain states, in states that are already democratic or transitioning to democracy, mm -hmm. these quick successions actually tell us that something is working. In other states, and remember that this is not, uh, we're talking about uh, three states that are fairly democratic this year, um, Ethiopia, uh, you could put Ethiopia in a box, but if you go further back, look at successions in Togo and in Gabon, mm -hmm. situations where uh, the legitimacy of the uh, the previous regime was questioned and democracy was uh, still a difficult issue. In those cases, you had quick secessions too, but they actually affirmed the lack of democratic norms and the weakness of the institutional uh, system uh, in, uh, with respect to ability of uh, challenges to make uh, demands on the state. And in, uh, the result of that was uh, extension of autocratic one-party rule, and in some cases, um, you know, you really had uh, these dynastic secessions. Mm -hmm. And so in certain instances, these quick secessions tell us that uh, democracy is working. In other instances, it's the absence of democracy that allows the uh, smooth secession to take place. Now then, there are those cases like, say, in Mali, which throws, I think, everything up in the air. You have literally a usurpment of power within days of President Amadou Toure's uh, election, or, well, he'd already decided he was not going to run. But here you have this coup to literally derail the course of democracy. Yes. Is that uh, something that to, something to be at least concerned about in future? Yes. Whenever you have institutional vacuum, when you have a power vacuum following the death of a leader, um, you are likely to see the military as set itself. You saw that in Ivory Coast, where the long-time um, leader of Fibuain died, and there was a vacuum. And you, a lot of the conflict that we saw, the military reemerge as, as a factor. Um, so that's likely to happen in places where the, uh, the civic institutions are weak, and the military is always standing by to take advantage. They're always looking for an excuse to step in. Mm -hmm. And so in set uh, situations, you, you're likely to see a coup. Well, thank you so much for putting those things in perspective for us. That's uh, Professor, Assistant Pro uh, Professor Kweku Nwama of uh, American University who joined us here on In Focus. Thank you again so much. Thanks for having me.